It's great to be here today and see the evolution um, from the Sustainable A Agriculture Resource Consortium to the Center for Sustainability here at Cal Poly. And, you know, in the early days, you know, it, it was just seemed so daunting to try to get this thing off the ground and really be able to provide value to the agricultural community and to drive good practices and engage the community. So it really warms my heart to see this happening today. Um, as Hunter said, I've been directing the School Food Initiative for the Orfila Foundation for the last five and a half years. And our mission there was to um, get public school food service operations to implement and sustain scratch cooking operations. And our focus was on providing free culinary training to school food service workers. We provided grants for equipment. I think that right now we're exceeding $5 million in grants for equipment. And we also have a team of professional chefs that provide ongoing technical assistance out there to all the school kitchens. And we also have a food literacy component to our initiative. We installed over 35 school gardens and elementary schools in Santa Barbara County and paid for a dedicated garden manager at each site. Um, the Orfila Fund is getting ready to sunset in December of 2015, so we're wrapping up all of our initiative work. And what we're focusing on, and have been probably for the last year, is really um, getting schools to foster a culture of health and wellness to preserve the work that we've done, and really getting them engaged in sustaining this work. So it's been really wonderful to see how my culinary background and my interest in um, sustainable agriculture have all really come together. And, um, and it's been great to be here today and listen to all the speakers. And so I have the pleasure now to, um, to introduce a man, and he's a really busy guy. Usually, you know, I can speak off the cuff, but I'm gonna have to read here because he's been involved in lots of projects, lots of boards. As Hunter said, A.G. Kawamura is the former secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture. He co-chairs Solutions from the Land, which is a nonprofit uh, project that is facilitating sustainable collaborations for 21st century ag systems. And he currently serves on several boards and committees, uh, which include Ag Advisory Committee for the Ag Agree Initiative, He's on the board, uh, board on Agriculture and Natural Resources, which is a policy arm of the National Academy of Sciences, Ag Advisory Committee for the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, the American Farmland Trust, the 25 by 25 Alliance, which is a national alliance of renewable energy stakeholders. He's the former chair and current board member of the Western Growers Association, and he participates in the Southern California Water Committee California Water Reuse Board, and is a founding member of the Delta Vision Foundation. As a progressive third generation conventional and certified organic farmer, AG has a lifetime of experience working within the shrinking rural and urban boundaries of Southern California. He's worked collaboratively for over 30 years with local food banks toward the elimination of hunger in Orange County through pioneering urban ag strategies. Together with his brother, Matt, they're engaged in building an exciting, interactive, 100-acre agricultural showcase at the Orange County Great Park in Irvine, California. Please join me in welcoming A.G. Kawamura. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, what time is it? Approaching the end of the day, and I'll try and make this uh, interesting. More importantly, I'll try hopefully make uh, a, a, some of us open our eyes. There was a lot of great ap optimism today, and uh, thank you to Hunter and Kathy for the in invitation to be here. Um, as an urban farmer, and I really say urban farmer where we are, we, uh, we farm right in the middle of uh, the Irvine area, uh, in the Seal Beach area down to San Juan Capistrano. And we've been doing that uh, since I was uh, two years old when we moved from uh, the Los Angeles area around LAX, which used to be all farm fields uh, in the Venice Compton area. 
But uh, in my lifetime then, I've had a chance to watch some of the most incredible farmland on the planet with some of the best weather and best resources uh, slowly be urbanized with no plan for the future other than uh, the leapfrogging that took place. I was fortunate to farm on the Irvine Ranch down there, which had a very strong commitment to agriculture and still does. And in that small gap, gap of uh, time that they've moved forward with their ranch, it was an old Spanish land grant, uh, we were able to at least find a niche for ourselves that even today is something that we believe very strongly in. Uh, we farm on about almost a thousand acres of leased land. We don't own any of the land that we farm on. So when we were talking about how you look at the future, I look at the future very differently than other people. And in fact, the experience we have of having to move everything from our equipment yard to our headquarters to our different ranches, it's a very, very precarious kind of farming, but we're used to it and it's become actually a bit of an asset that allows us to operate within this, uh, if you will, urban nexus. We have uh, basically over 20 million people that live within about a two and a half hour drive. And if you expand out to three hours or three and a half hours, which gets you out to Las Vegas, down past Tijuana, all the way up to Santa Barbara, that's uh, about 25 million people basically that live uh, where we can deliver a same day harvested product into those, that marketplace. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, today about uh, what was really spoken about all day today, this uh, renaissance of agriculture, which is taking place not just in the United States, not just here in SLO, uh, uh, but all over the world, you're starting to see a clear uh, appreciation, a clear kind of a reconnection, if you will, and there's been a tremendous disconnect uh, for the last generation and a half. I think it was mentioned earlier as we look back into our grandparents' lineage that, um, yes, it was true. Just at uh, a turn of the century, you had 40% of the American population actively engaged in earning most of the living or part of the living from agriculture. And today, uh, the, the, the the statistic that came out, if you kick out the $2,000 uh, revenue earners that were down to a very small percentage of the American population that is currently engaged in agriculture. That being said, it opens the door, what I would say, for a uh, tremendous amount of opportunities. Agricultural urbanism, which is not to be mistaken for uh, agricultural ur urban agriculture, uh, is a concept that was introduced about in 2009 and actually earlier uh, by Andres Duani, is a, who's a very well-known urban landscaper who realized that uh, agriculture was something more than uh, just an activity that sits outside of society. In fact, he very clearly recognized that society, obviously, as much as society needs agriculture because we have to eat, agriculture needs society. And he started to weave together a lot of really interesting ideas of uh, what, what agriculture will look like here in the 21st century. I had never heard of the gentleman. I didn't know anything about him. I had a chance after coming back from Sacramento to be introduced to a, a group of folks from the, uh, the Urban Landscape Institute, where, which, is a, which was a group of a bunch of different uh, landscape architects, urban planners, different folks that build cities, basically. And uh, I was told uh, at, a, uh, at one of their meetings that this fella, Andres Duani, uh, not that long ago in a conference down in the Orange County area in front of an enormous room of landscape planners made a simple pronouncement. He said uh, to them, uh, agriculture is the new golf, which I liked a lot. Actually, I thought that was a pretty amazing. Agriculture is the new golf. So as they, you thought about building out communities, the amenities that a community needs, which used to be parks, which used to be golf courses, which used to be things like that, suddenly there's this enormous uh, interest in amenities for communities that revolve around food. Uh, this is the former golf course uh, at the old El Toro Marine Base. It was abandoned about 12 years ago, and my company uh, came and repurposed this just within the last year. So if you can imagine this picture, this is a couple fairways side by side uh, that we were able to come on in. Uh, it's on its way towards being a part of a large metropolitan park, but in the interim time, uh, before it becomes a part of a wildlife corridor over here on, the, on your right, and as it becomes basically some other aspect of a park, it may stay agriculture, we don't know. But at this time, we found that underneath that uh, incredible golf course, as you would expect, because golf courses are green, it's a little easier to 
uh, understand how that might be, we found some fantastic ground and some fantastic growing conditions. And because it had been abandoned 12, 12 years ago or so, 13 years ago, we were able to certify it at organic uh, oh, pretty much as this first crop of strawberries went in. Um, one of the things that we might observe here with this piece of ground specifically, um, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, it was the prize lima bean field of um, uh, James Irvine, the, of the Irvine Company, and it was up in an area, you, those of you who under, understand lima beans, lima beans were dry farmed in those days, and to be able to get a crop off of, of lima beans off in the area that doesn't get much water means that you had to put it in a spot that would get benefit of the early spring winter rains, but wouldn't freeze. And so this is on, a, on the slopes, basically on the, 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 the plaza of the whole basin, the Orange County LA basin has some of these wonderful areas that are right up against the foothills where the cold air slopes downwards and uh, it leaves it with a great alluvial plain, if you will, and, and some of the greatest ground I've ever seen. And we're thrilled to get a chance to farm it, but at the same time, we're also cognizant of the fact that our time there is limited uh, while we get this chance. Um, urban agriculture or agricultural urbanism then, depending on how you look into the future, can take on a whole bunch of different uh, shapes, forms, and exciting new ways of thinking about food production. Uh, those of us who wear glasses or might have had uh, eye surgery or whatever, when you change your lens of how you look at things, obviously you get a different vision. And one of the things that we're seeing very clearly here, I hope all of us are starting to see, that if you change your lens of what's out there ahead of us, then you get a different vision of what's possible. Uh, some of these uh, ideas of what our world will look like, uh, has anybody had a chance to go out to Abu Dhabi or Dubai? These are incredible, incredible, basically 21st century cities built out of nothing, out of the sand, uh, along the side of an ocean. And the sustainability concepts that are going into how these constructed uh, new cities might be are really pretty exciting to see. We build, we watch around the rest of the world, cities built on top of cities, built on top of cities over the course of a thousand years, two thousand years, and what, yet at the same time we're seeing some brand new kinds of ways of looking at urban agriculture that might fit into any number of uh, uh, cities anywhere on the planet. So it's not one size fits all. In fact, uh, again, it's what your imagination allows you to see. Um, what your imagination allows you to see then is something, if you can imagine it, it becomes feasible in these, this day and age because we have so many tools to work with. And the tools then that we have to work with are evolving every day. And uh, those new technologies that we thought we were, were, were wish list uh, technologies just a decade or two decades ago, whether it's 3D printing, these things that are coming forward right now are allowing us to re-envision, re-map, rethink about what food production might be. Um, I go back uh, to six, about 16, 17 years ago. Uh, our company, uh, we grow vegetables, we grow green beans, we've grown celery and cabbage for many, many years. Um, uh, when I was pretty young into our company, uh, I remember there was a specific event that took place. We were growing um, cabbage one day. And uh, I see Whole Foods was giving that uh, remarks a few minutes ago. And uh, luckily, uh, it's not a panel because I'd have a few comments for Whole Foods. Um, but that's, that's um, and we work with Whole Foods, so I, I, have, I probably should be careful in what I actually say about that. But we were farming uh, at a time when the cabbage market happened to be horrible. We had a field of cabbage that we'd had a, enough of an infestation of worms that got in it. It was a conventional field that we had some worm damage. But when the market's just cheap, and there's an oversupply of product on the market. Everybody that is going to sell a product, it better look really good, otherwise you're going to have to throw it away. And at this point in time, we were throwing about half of the cabbage on the ground because of that old worm damage that happened to be on each head of cabbage, and it was beautiful cabbage. And in terms of talking about our urban presence within a county, um, I remember we had had a group of uh, gleaners that had come by our, our fields asking if they could come in and glean the products because they could see in this is in the 80s, early 80s, late 70s and early 80s, all the agriculture that was still in Orange County. There was peppers, there was asparagus, celery, cabbage, there was even lettuce, sweet corn, and they could see things thrown away as they drove around our areas and they asked if they could come into our fields and we said pretty clearly, no. 
We were afraid of the liability. We had heard of some nightmare stories where families would come in, kids would get hold of tomato stakes, be sword fighting with the stakes. One kid poked the other kid's eye out and they sue the farmer, right? And we just realized that getting people into your fields, families and a lot of folks, that wasn't gonna work. But this day that we were throwing all this cabbage away on the ground, I remember feeling very mad and angry because I remember that uh, there's just something about throwing perfectly good things that you've grown, that you've put your time and effort into growing, and yet it can't make the marketplace. Now, we're talking about globally a problem that we have 40% or 30 40% of the food get, gets thrown away before it even makes it to the marketplace. A lot of that is the cosmetic activity that's going on in terms of things don't look good enough. And when you talk to a group like Whole Foods, if it doesn't look perfect, they have a pretty tough quality control program. Uh, I'd love them to see, uh, there's a new video called Inglorious Fruit and Fruit and Vegetables that is in Europe right now where they're actually selling all the ugly looking fruits and vegetables at a discount and people are buying them up. Uh, left and right because they're discounted. They know people recognize they're perfectly good to eat, but they're not making it into the marketplace unless you have a gimmick like that. Well, in this case, uh, I remember calling the gleaners up. We uh, said, hey, I tell you what, you can't come in the fields, but bring us as many boxes as you can. And so they did, and that day we gave them a couple tons of cabbage that we were throwing away on the ground. And after that day, we continued this relationship with them, which eventually developed into a great relationship with gleaners, because in 19, we were talking about how important policy is for opening up the door for how a farmer might exist, especially in an urban area, but really over, across our whole country. Um, we, uh, in the 1989, I believe, 87, 89, the Good Samaritan Act passed, which said that if you're an act of a charity, you have some protection against liability uh, of things going wrong and if uh, and so you'd have some protection against a negligence charge if someone tripped and fell while they were in your field gleaning but we took that law as a great opportunity then to start a wonderful gleaning program and at that time then we opened up our fields and we started uh, allowing people in to glean squash to green glean, glean sweet corn uh, I remember a group of 700 kids coming out kindergartners and sixth graders holding hands and they disappeared into one of our cornfields and you were worried about what was going to happen to them in there because they were gleaning uh, sweet corn and you could hear them giggling and laughing and these kids came out just dirty with aphid, everything all over them. And, and if you've ever been in a cornfield, it gets kind of icky. Uh, but they were so having so much fun and they gleaned uh, a truckload of perfectly good sweet corn that couldn't get harvested that day. But we had plenty of stories like that. And we started to realize that working with the food banks, they don't need a lot of times huge loads of stuff that uh, is just semi-good uh, because it's after we've harvested glean products. And we started to explore this idea, let's custom grow food with the food banks that we have. This little piece of ground here, the houses on the right were just put in that not that long before. Um, and we asked uh, the neighbors, uh, we asked the city, hey, what is this uh, piece of ground? What are you going to do with this piece of ground underneath the wires? Immediately to the left here is the Amtrak tracks, the railroad tracks. And they told us, oh, we're going to put a park there next to the houses as a buffer. It's a green strip of, of land for as a buffer. And we said, who really wants to be at a park next to a railroad tracks? Uh, um, why don't you let us have the field, and we'll, we're going to custom grow food with the food bank. And with our gleaners and a bunch of volunteers and friends, we all showed up at the supervisor. I mean the county, uh, the city, the city council, and we had done our homework. We thought we got in front of them and said we want to uh, custom grow food for instead of gleaning, we want our volunteers to be able to harvest, and we're going to go directly into the food bank. And of course, the city council said no. They said we're not going to zone this for agriculture. I'm sorry. It sounds like a nice idea, but see you. Uh, and now the politics of no is something I want you to make sure you understand, all of you, the young people out there. The politics of no just means that you have to be patient. You have to think very hard about what it is that you want to accomplish where everybody can have a win of some sort, but people, there's a win-win opportunity. So we came back after a little work, and we, luckily we had made some very good friends on the inside of that city council that understood what we were trying to accomplish. And they were willing to go out on a limb. Uh, this is 16 years ago, way ahead of a lot of the other stuff you see today. And they, uh, we went and presented to them a new plan. We said, hey, we're going to create an edible park. We'll call it under horticultural, out of the horticulture uh, uh, permit. What do you think? Of course, they said yes. 
and uh, the Incredible Edible Park was born then at that point. And the Incredible Edible Park, here's the power lines, it's uh, had a couple iterations. Currently, this is an older picture, currently it has citrus and other things in, underneath it. And the point is that when you create these kind of opportunities for agriculture to thrive in a different capacity than you're normally used to, um, night, really exciting things start to happen. Um, you get families uh, from seniors working with their grandkids, you get uh, schools that suddenly uh, adopt your field because that's now their outdoor science laboratory. You get a, a tremendous amount of folks that are able to talk at the school lunch level about the nutrition uh, benefits of being involved. Um, we, we, we continue then to work down this path. The Incredible Edible Park has now become the Incredible Edible Farm uh, at our new site at, this, uh, at the Orange County Great Park, which is one of the larger metropolitan parks being built in America right now. Uh, it's twice the size of New York City's Central Park, just to get an idea of scope of size. It's about uh, 1,200 acres uh, worth of a park. And somehow, we've kind of weaseled our way in there, and they've allowed the thought, and at this point, the concept that agriculture can be a part of an urban uh, metropolitan park. Um, we're Convinced, though, that in terms of how we understand our presence within an urban area, and I think that's what's important about this conference right now, resilience. We can talk about the resilience uh, of just staying in business when your well one runs dry. I have a field in Southern California uh, this last June, not this last June, 2014, my well went dry uh, two weeks before harvesting a beautiful beautiful crops, of, a crop of certified organic green beans. And we were fortunate that our next door neighbor, which is a nursery, gave us a little tiny bit of water so we didn't lose the crop. And we were also fortunate that the weather was nice and cool. We ended up losing about 15, 20% of that field because of the lack of water, we couldn't finish it off. And then the, our landlord said after we finished it, uh, because our landlord happens to have uh, avocados and citrus above us, and there's some other bigger nurseries upstream from us, they've basically shut us off the, off the ground uh, for a lack of rain this winter. So the drought is a very real uh, event for me. If that had been my only farm, and it's a 60 acre piece, we're farming eight acres of butternut squash on it right now, so 52 acres are fallow. And we're done with the squash, that might be it for this year also. Uh, it's a very real uh, crisis that we're in that can only get worse if we don't step up and do some resilient planning and adaptation very quickly. I'm lucky that many, most of the rest of my fields use reclaim water. In fact, we use a tremendous amount of the reclaim water for the last 20 something years down in the uh, Orange County area only because some of the most most progressive water districts on the face of the planet have always anticipated that we would arrive at a place where we wouldn't have enough money, and they've built the infrastructure, built the systems, and designed them for drought, drought conditions because they knew that was going to happen. And so we're fortunate to have foresight and be the beneficiary of that. Our state is not so lucky right now because we have a tremendous amount of work to do in terms of creating new infrastructure, new water, and new sources for where we're going to go. When you look at producing food, I just want to make sure, it was mentioned earlier, food production, whether you're big, whether you're small, we, it was really important to hear some of the comments today, whether you're organic, conventional, or biodynamic, the different systems give us tremendous amount of diversity in how we might approach our food system supply. And I think what's exciting about that is we're seeing an explosion of new ways of looking at systems. When I got back from uh, Sacramento, I, I uh, left office in 2010, uh, early January 2011. One of the first things I did is I took a fl plane out to Florida uh, to visit Disney's uh, Epcot Center. The ex Epcot, is, uh, anybody been to Epcot Center? Have you, many of you have heard of it. The experimental prototype community of tomorrow, that's what Epcot is. Built in 1982, as far as when it started. Uh, they have the geodesic, geodesic dome. See that right there below? Can you see there's a little boat ride in it? There's, you know, here's another picture. See the boat ride? You go through the Epcot Center and you get to see, uh, for the last 20 something years, 30 years almost, hydroponics and advanced systems of agriculture at the at the agricultural component of the Epcot, uh, uh, Epcot um, 
uh, park there at Disney World. And uh, interestingly, USDA had a big hand in providing the money to bring in some of the newest ways of looking at agricultural systems uh, in, in that park. Um, what we have to recognize, it's taken a long time for hydroponics, for aquaponics, for aeroponics, for all these new systems to really mature, but they've matured alongside with the digital revolution of precision uh, technologies that allow you to do the kind of work that has to take place. I, I make a joke regularly that we can also thank the marijuana growers of America for perfecting these uh, uh, technologies and methods of uh, producing things in closed environments and very, very efficient uh, delivery systems. Um, but the truth is, we're, we're, we're embracing then the fact that we have new systems to work with, uh, recognizing that we have scarce resources like a lack of water. Uh, here we're about, uh, this is at that great park where we were about to put uh, an, a hydroponic uh, platform system. So now we're going to go vertical a little bit. And when you go vertical, you, instead of measuring your production by the square foot, you're able to measure the production by the cubic foot. You might have read some of these stories about a hydroponic uh, lettuce facility down in uh, Japan that produces off a single acre about 100 acres worth of lettuce because they go vertical. I'm familiar with in my own county uh, a building that's almost this size, a little smaller actually, of hydroponically grown um, microgreens. And it looks like going into a... Uh, 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 dry cleaners because everything's on conveyor belts and moves around and the irrigation systems uh, are stationary while the plants, in this case, the irrigation gets, each, each segment gets watered as it moves by slowly and uh, they, the, by the time the one rack of stuff goes around and comes back, you're ready to harvest while over here you're putting the transplant in and the system takes, you know, 35, 40, 50 days depending on what, what's, what they're trying to grow. I have a friend who's growing hydroponic lettuce down in uh, Encinitas need us uh, go green. He's, he's, it's a tremendous uh, operation that's only been up for about five years now, I believe. And it's two, a son and his father, they're both engineers. They're not agriculturalists, but they're really smart engineers, and they understood these systems. One of the interesting things they did on their first, uh, if you buy lettuce, uh, butter, butter lettuce with a little root inside of it, inside a little plastic container, that's the kind of company they built and they're, they're one of, uh, actually they can't get enough to supply a company like Whole Foods right now. One of the things they did the first year out, they knew that they were just trying to work and get the experience to get their production technique up and running. And for their first year, the entire first year, they donated all their products to the food bank because they knew that if they had customers, restaurants and stuff, and they had a crop failure or missed a, a planting or the, the electricity didn't work or the circuitry board was off, they knew that they would, mess, they would anger that client so much so that they might never get them back. So they spent a year uh, trying to perfect their systems and they did a good job. Uh, we, we use those platforms. This is a, we tried out some strawberries on there. I'm not very happy with them actually right now. This is, was a first generation. We've had a couple of the generations. We've realized that lettuce, which is a vegetable, is very easy on these kind of systems. Strawberries, a fruiting crop, is a lot more difficult. It's just there's a lot more variables when you're trying to coax a, a plant to give you fruit consistently over a long period of time. Strawberries, for example, will pick for eight, nine months, maybe maybe 10 months, and you have to try and always make sure it's in a fruiting stage, because suddenly if it goes vegetative and for a month you're not picking anything, well, you better have a bunch of other varieties that fill the gap. So there's a lot of things involved in doing these kind of systems. Uh, my point is, as you look at what's available for the urban farmer these days, there's a tremendous amount of new ways to look at food production, both traditional but also uh, uh, these different ways. Uh, some of you have had a chance to go down south and see the Howling Nursery. Uh, you would all know that currently, I believe in the United States, the number is about approaching 50% of all the vine ripe tomatoes in America are produced in hothouses or, or closed environment houses at this point, 50%. Um, we were laughing that the, the number one canning tomato capital of the United States uh, in 19... 61. Does anybody know where it was? In 1961, the number one canning tomato capital of the United States was Delaware. And then the University of California invented the harvestable, machine harvestable, uh, hard skin tomato. 
and in a very short amount of time, in fact, our family grew some, uh, some of those years ago cannery tomatoes that were harvested by a machine. That entire industry came out here where you had a much more predictable climate and a much better outcome in terms of pounds per acre. Um, the way you look at then how we might produce nutrient-dense foods has expanded our, our, our perspective, has expanded our potentiality. And now we realize that there's all kinds of ways to produce, whether it's a traditional fruits or veggies, whether it's microgreens, whether it's herbs and spices, and the movement towards food as medicine has never been more exciting also because some of the derivatives that are inside of these different plants and these different spices uh, are becoming uh, actually mainstreamed into a new way of looking at holistic medicines, if you will, and not even holistics, but very clear active ingredients that are providing uh, some great benefits to health and great benefits for healing. Um, I know that our experience with trying to stay in business under a barrage uh, of rules and regulations under uh, everybody's new certification scheme or you know join my club and we'll feature you as a, a featured grower none of that is changing anytime soon you have a very demanding consumer who lives in a world of abundance who is going to be determined to get things the way they want and you have, as a, as a producer, can decide to find the clientele that fits your uh, willingness to go along with that. Or you can change what you're growing. You can do a lot of these different things. But I, I want to empathize with the, the gentleman who mentioned how tough it is these days for farmers to stay in business. It's never been, never been uh, more difficult. I mean, it's never been more difficult than it is now. Uh, we talk about putting a gun to your head and on any given day what might put you out of business. And so I understand changing climate. I understand uh, disease pathogens that suddenly show up. I understand being in a, qu a quarantine because of somebody next door and you can't ship your products. I certainly understand what happens when um, uh, a market collapses because there's too much imported product from another area and the market is just glutted. This year on our strawberry uh, production, uh, the eastern seaboard was completely shut down from Chicago to Boston down to New York with snowstorms. All through the time in January, February, we had tremendous production because of the unusually warm weather this year. And because of that weather, all the production that came out of Florida, out of Mexico, everybody was early. It was a very mild winter. Shows up on the west coast because they can't ship stuff to the East Coast because all the stores are closed down. They can, no one can even get out of their house. And all that production collapsed the market, collapses the markets here. And we've never seen going into Easter, going into Valentine's Days, markets so low. And for those of us depending on that early market, if this is the new norm, extreme storms on the East Coast, unusually warm weather here, we have to think differently on how we're going to uh, produce things. Vision then of what you can do and what you can't do becomes then the focus of this last few seconds of my talk is that this is uh, the old El Toro Marine Basin. Yep, in between those pods of land, that's us farming. Uh, see that there's in the distance you can see a, a navigation cone, a VOR cone out there, that the little white thing. Uh, evidently, uh, someday when this is a complete Metropolitan Park and will be moved off of many of this. There's this last little circle around that uh, VOR cone that they, it's because you can't build a building uh, up against the cone that that's currently designated as the last stand for us on this project uh, where we've tried to create uh, a, a showcase for what 21st century agriculture will look like. Uh, we've uh, had a nice part of this project. We grew some algae. We wanted to show that we could grow a very quick and uh, up fast system of algae, uh, harvest it, turn it into some oils, uh, put it as biodiesel or put it into the food system. We've uh, looked at putting a, a brand new orchard in here for the first time, maybe the first planting of stone fruit in almost 60 years in Orange County. And we went specifically after a specific kind of rootstock that didn't need uh, heavy chilling because we know that we don't get that kind of a freeze in Orange County to be able to set that plant into dormancy and give us the kind of uh, yield we want. So we've done some of our homework, but I think it was still war too warm even this year for those trees because they've got a really weird, the trees, the trees are very confused. They've got blooms when they shouldn't have blooms and uh, we've got odd weather that we've never seen before. In, in finishing up here then, the focus that we have on farm systems, I, I just, for those of you who might want to be 
producers in an urban area. Uh, it really is very exciting. There's a ton of land available if the policy is correct and if you're able to convince uh, the city council, the county supervisors to free up that land as an interim use. I complain all the time that I can't find 40 acres to farm on in Orange County and yet in this area around Detroit there's 40 square miles of abandoned properties. In LA and Orange County there's 40 square miles worth of abandoned or, or unused properties. They might be parking lots, they might be vacant lots, they're owned by the county, by the military, by the cities. Uh, we farm, uh, lease ground from the utilities, we lease ground from the military, we, we lease ground from cities, we le are in the process of leasing a property from the county. We look for uh, landlords that will allow us to use their properties because if we are on their property and we're good stewards, they don't have an endangered species problem, they don't have weed abatement, fire dangers, they don't have people dumping stuff on the property, they don't have rodent control. Uh, anybody that owns a place of property that's not doing anything, they have costs to take care of the land. If you're a good steward of that land, a good land manager with an agricultural paradigm for that landowner, they can look at you as an asset. But I'll caution you in these kind of conferences and the feel good about agriculture is the minute you're a liability to a landlord, they want you off your property. So when uh, a large community garden in Los Angeles was being shut down because the landlord finally wanted to develop the property and they created a riot and they villainized and demonized the landlord, uh, many of us started to say, are you kidding? You know, how can you guys attack the landlord that allowed you to be there for 20, 30 years? How can you possibly not understand that if you attack that landlord and that becomes the new norm where every landlord in, the, in urban lands or suburban lands around the country realizes that they don't want agriculture on that property because of the chance of being villainized, demonized, stopped in their development, who's going to want you on that property? And I'll make the observation that there's a lot of farmers in this country, a lot of farmers around the world that don't own their property, but they farm very well on someone else's property and the relationship it has to be a good symbiotic relationship over the time that they're willing to let you have the property. So as we have our good feel, our feel good, good feelings about uh, urban agriculture and what, what it means and what it can be, there are some caveats and the most important caveats again are that um, you, you must recognize that you need to be an asset to a city council or a board of supervisors or an asset to the food bank. We're growing this field right here, this lettuce right now is uh, the former officer's housing uh, block where they pulled the houses off, they pulled the cement foundations off, and guess what was underneath those cement foundations? Some incredible great dirt that had not been farmed for 70, 80 years, so it missed the entire 60-something uh, 60 60 years. So that ground underneath those houses, if you will, missed the entire industrial farming uh, uh, inputs of the 40s, 50s, 50s 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, what we're doing with this project right now, the food bank is working collaboratively with a handful of us, including our farm bureaus, and we're custom growing food for the food bank. It goes right into the food bank. Same day harvest going right into the uh, customers that need it the most. It's a really rewarding project. It can be replicated and scaled up or down. We're kind of working at it. If the city provides ground that was sitting idle for free, if a, the water district gives you water for free, in an area like Orange County, free water and free land, rent are two of our highest costs. Rent and water are two of our highest costs. And if the labor from all the food bank volunteers that come out help you plant or help you weed or help you uh, harvest, it's a great model to at least help you get engaged in production uh, working with a mentor, maybe an old farmer that's somewhat retired but can get up and help you get up to speed. But then from here, you start to learn the skill sets that might allow you to go find that next large vacant lot or small vacant lot or any uh, abandoned parking lot or warehouse and get that next step of your uh, our agricultural career into gear and, and you're up and running and you're running a business. So here's what I would want to tell you then. Uh, when you live in an area with millions of people around you, 
Uh, the marketing opportunities are incredible. The production opportunities are incredible. Uh, I wish I could start a livestock operation in Orange County, and, and if, you, yeah, if you have any interest, uh, Mark, to come on down there and help us. There's some open space. There's zero, zero agricultural uh, livestock operations, just about maybe 99% zero, you know. Uh, and you can see the, 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 the opportunity. It's just having the vision to take that new lens and look through it and then and create a vision that will work for you. So with that, I know you're going to have a great uh, uh, episode tomorrow. You've got some more um, uh, talk to do. Uh, Hunter, thank you very much for your great work. And uh, uh, again, I look forward to w watching you all. <laughs>